Okay. You, you can tell that the first one of this um, series of talks that's under the heading of S1191F um, well, I did it a few years ago and uh, I wasn't sure whether to publish it and it kept kept on at me. I wasn't happy with the beginning. I wasn't sure as I knew what it meant myself. And the more I worked on it, the more God's turned it to a blessing as I see it. So I'm publishing it all with all the comments, including this one. And one of the hardest bits was the first 10 or so minutes. Because when I reheard it, you know, this is a couple of years later, isn't it now? I didn't know what to make of it. Let me pause a sec. So it starts by saying that the reality of God is more subtle than uh, scriptural story and so on. And the more I dwelt on it, the more I came to the realisation that it is indeed all connected with this notion that we don't know who we are, what we are, any more than we could define God or truly visualize reliably how he would be or is. We're clear that we experience the world, but it's how we experience it that matters to us. And experience is not a, a tangible thing. It's uh, something to do with relationship, r relating to, thinking about. And none of this world makes sense without thought. I mean, that's sort of obvious truism, isn't it? It's a sense is rational thought. If I'm truly not able to think about the warmth or the sunshine or the chair I'm in, then it has no existence to me. It only has existence in the way it affects my feelings and how I react to such in what I've called my mind, although I might have decided the mind is in, in the brain in the forehead, but uh, it's not visual, it's not seeable, it's not tangible. The apparatus might be like a computer, but the program for the computer could be written out somewhere and explained, and then it's the cause of the hardware being formed in the way that it is and, and reorganized accordingly. But it's the intangible that matters. And we know it's life that matters to us. So what we really value is the intangible bit, which we hope and expect is influenced, even determined by the tangible. But we also know that our thoughts can determine our actions, which can affect the tangible world we're in. And then we have a different tangible layout to the world we're in, which gives different experiences and thoughts and so forth. But the life is not the objects in the world. It's the thoughts about them that matter to us. Hence my problem with um, meditation, that the thoughts are an action. It's not a stillness. And I 
can think of, for instance, one and one making two. But to meditate on it, do I keep thinking one and one makes two, one and one makes two? You know, even if I repeat it verbally in my mind, in the end my thought's not really following it. What is it to say I'm thinking about? I don't know, I just do it. And sometimes I don't. And I know when I am and I realize times when I'm not. Can I prove that the sun exists? Um, don't know if that's particularly an interesting question. I can tell you that I appreciate the sunshine. And sometimes it's too hot for me. I don't appreciate it. In other words, I can tell you what thoughts I have as regards the object you're talking about. <laughs> I can't, in a sense, tell you anything about the object in itself. Only my thoughts about the object and how it may be organized and be. You ask a person if they can prove if God exists, is as daft as saying, can you prove who you are? Do you, in what sense are you a person? What do you mean by a person? Show me a person. Uh, is it your body that's a person? Is it your arms, your head, your legs? Is it all of them? Is it the way they're organized at the minute? And this was the, the Buddhist um, contention, wasn't it? That, um, the self doesn't exist. At what point uh, can I say this is the um, eternal being, the uh, independent quality that we say this is Marshall? And in fact, the nearest you can get to is to say, well, Marshall is experienced in a sense in some sense in accordance with the values and purposes and will that he has. And that changes through time. So Marshall is a changing entity. To which he replies, yes, of course, I'm alive, you fool. I mean, obviously I'm changing. <laughs> That's what we mean by alive. When he stops breathing and stops moving, we say, he's dead, dead, gone. Oh. Better burn the body then before it goes off. Or bury it. We're not here to prove God. That's absurd. To think that we could prove God. I am here to know God in the sense of how he relates to me. He gives me thoughts. Gives me breath. Gives me alive. I'm alive because of him. I'm in a universe, presumably because of him too. I can't somehow live comfortably with the view that it all comes from nothing. I ascribe it to him. I enjoy ascribing it to him and doing so brings me great blessing. So I'm going to continue to do it. <laughs> In fact, I ascribe to him everything that's good and lovely. And when I'm really, uh, really flying, I, I start to ascribe even the, the bad things as being good. It's just that it's beyond my understanding of how they're good. But not beyond his. Because I've seen so much goodness in my life. I've come to trust him for the bad as well. Well, that's a fairly heroic thing to do. Uh, not really. I've found it to be an incredible blessing. I mean, if you practice it a little, you, you, you'll, as I understand it, be quickly following the same, the same road. You'll be flying. Just like me. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not flying all the time. I have days when I've... Uh, got preoccupied with something else and I realized, my goodness, I'm unspiritual today. What's the matter with me? Or I've got bogged down with some worry or concern. What do I do? Oh, well, I do my breathing exercise. 
Why? Because I might not be able to deliberately change the mind, but I can change my breathing. And my breathing changes my heart, literally the physical heart, and it changes what's happening in the mind. My preoccupation probably with the breathing probably gets me off the preoccupation with the problem. And I get back to some sort of flying equilibrium again. I'm happy. I'm uh, reassured. Now, you may not know how to do the breathing. You're not really keen on you know, the triangular breathing that I've recommended to you at times. Okay, choose good company. Choose good media. Watch a program or listen to something that you've always found inspiring in the past. How about that series called The Chosen? I don't care how much of it's fiction. I thought it was a wonderful production. Why? Because it touched on so many things that I value. That's why, I expect. I was in tears just listening to various episodes in that series, several series together, aren't there? But perhaps that's not your scene. But whatever is good company from your point of view, choose it. Get you back on an even keel. And that's what the uh, Eastern view of yoga was meant to do. And the Western view of prayer to God and praising God was to preoccupy the mind with goodness. Might be some mantra. Might be the recitation of some scripture. Psalm, say. It changes what your mind is preoccupied with and frees you from some dead-end track obsession of the mind cuts across it. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Don't let it choose you. Unless it's God, of course. Well, that's just wonderful. If it's your God, it has to be your God the one that you value and love. Of course, thou shalt love the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, soul, mind and strength. Bless you. Thank you, Dad. <laughs>